Watch everybody. As promised, I wanted to run through this poll that we conducted on the group where I asked um, what are the main drivers that you can see that would increase the XRP price moving forward in the future and, and in what order you would expect them to occur. So let's go through this. Unsurprisingly, uh, the Ripple SEC case got 48%. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone can disagree that the main pressure that has been causing XRP price suppression has been the SEC case versus Ripple. Um, hopefully that will conclude in, in a positive way for XRP holders. And when it does, we can definitely expect uh, a big increase in the price of XRP. Um, what will follow immediately from that is a relisting of XRP on US exchanges. And as the um, the there's a high demand for XRP in the US, but it is difficult to satisfy that demand because the supply is being constrained because of delisting of XRP from US exchanges. Once they relist it, we can expect there to be a demand pressure on the price. So again, it should give it a nice little lift. And then um, it's interesting that so many people are well informed in this group about the Ripple IPO, its uh, initial public offering. So Ripple fairly recently bought back a lot of their shares, amazingly, um, from their initial investors. I think their Series C, C round of funding, they bought back a lot of their shares, which is incredibly bullish when, when a company buys back its own shares from shareholders at a premium. Um, we can expect the IPO, the Ripple IPO, to have a massive impact on the price of XRP indirectly because it will give what is one of the most well-funded fintechs in the world i think you know um ripple has several billion in in the bank in its war chest it will massively increase that war chest which will mean that ripple can um, pursue a strategy of expansion development and uh, all of this will lead to one would imagine will lead to increased demand for um XRP and like greater adoption of, of XRPL. Um, some other some other kind of f factors that we considered as well as retail and enterprise adoption of XRP. I think these are going to be slow burns. Um, they will they will have a, a, a positive pressure, uh, a positive impact on the price of XRP for sure. But I don't think this is necessarily going to be huge day one. In fact, I, I think this will be um, a f fairly linear pressure on the price of XRP over time getting more and more um, as adoption increases and more there's more utility from applications that are being developed not just by Ripple but from other companies and organizations. Now something that we I discussed a while ago um, is actually X XRPL becoming a de facto layer two for Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has a number of layer two technologies. Um, most of them focus on either in improving the speed of Bitcoin transactions or reducing their costs, or, or and in some cases adding some kind of smarter functionality using the Bitcoin uh, layer one as a security for, for some kind of smart contract functionality. Now, Lightning is the best known, Lightning Networks is the best known um, layer two protocol for Bitcoin. And it's doing a, a pretty good job, pretty decent job of sending Satoshis, whizzing Satoshis around the world for very cheap. Um, but there is an alternative and the XRPL, the XRP ledger can easily be a layer two for Bitcoin. And in fact, there is a company that already exists today called Send the Bits, which was part of the uh, Amikai in the uh, Ripple SEC case. So they actually presented their use case to the to the judge and their use case is as a layer two for bitcoin so reducing the cost of bitcoin transactions increasing their speed using the xrpl so again i think you can see these technologies are not necessarily competing they can be very much complementary and that's lost on if you adopt a tribal view of crypto that's very quickly lost and you don't really see the benefit but yeah it Th that could have a positive impact for both Bitcoin and XRPL if we see more solutions on the XRPL that benefit Bitcoin users or bit Bitcoin holders. Um, then it gets a little bit more interesting from my perspective. What if XRP and Bitcoin become collateral for an international reserve asset? For example, like the IMF's special drawing right. 
improbable, I know, but I, certainly in the short term. But as we see the rise of um, or the fracturing of the global economy into different groups, for example, BRICS um, versus the IMF and the World Bank and, and, and maybe smaller, more regional groups or associations of co countries in the overall grand scheme of de-dollarizing, um, reducing their dependence on the dollar, then including cryptos as a collateral for an international reserve asset is, is a, I think, fairly smart thing to do. Um, the main thing is there's no counterparty risk with these cryptos. They're decentralized technology. So if you pick the right ones that are mature enough, Bitcoin, XRP, even, even maybe arguably Ethereum, but there's a reason for not doing that, which I'll get to, then um, they're as good as any other asset class to include um, in, a, in a balanced way for a, as collateral for an for a international reserve asset. So maybe, who knows, we'll see in the next five years something around that. And then finally, what some, something that no one's really talking about. Um, I, I hope I'm not the only one who's identified this. I'm sure I'm not, but I don't think people are really talking about it enough. But assuming there is a positive settlement for Ripple and XRP in this in the SEC case, then and Ripple gets um, well at that point, Ripple will have a SEC clarity on on it not being a security. Now. Uh, there are a lot of institutional investors that have moved into the crypto sector, not just for speculation like hedge funds, but they've actually allocated crypto as part of their treasury strategy. So the most famous example of this is MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor's company, he's the CEO. Uh, Michael Saylor convinced his board and shareholders to commit a large chunk of their um, fin financial, the, the fiat assets, essentially their profits, USD treasury, into Bitcoin. Now, I think that's a great idea. Um, you don't necessarily want to include all of your treasury function into Bitcoin, given its volatility. But if you if you believe, as Michael Saylor does with some conviction, that over the next 10 years, the Bitcoin will outperform other asset classes that are traditionally held in treasury functions to protect against inflation, then it's a great idea. Now, how does that affect the SEC Ripple case? Well, it's not just um, treasuries holding Bitcoin. A lot of them hold Ethereum. And if we get to a position where the arrangement of the settlement only gives clarity to XRP and not the broader crypto asset sector, then there is a fiduciary responsibility on chief financial officers and chief investment officers to ensure that the, the assets that they've used in their treasury are regulated. And if there's a question mark over Ethereum being a security, they are compelled, they will be compelled to liquidate those assets and either go, keep Bitcoin or increase their Bitcoin asset or potentially go for XRP because it would have regulatory clarity. Now, I don't know what the size of this impact will be on uh XRP, or even if you know the CFOs w of these institutions will um, recognize their f a fiduciary responsibility, but I think this is something that the XRP community should be making more of a sound about, more noise about this issue, because it will have a positive impact on the price. It's just how much is is difficult to tell at this stage. But as we've seen, you know, institutional investors coming into the digital asset market drove market cap to three trillion um, last year. So yeah, um, it's not a s small amount. Um, on another note, what I wanted to do is take a stab at um, coming up with a fag packet calculation for XRP's market cap in the future. And what I, what, what I want to do now is just play you this clip from Brad Garlinghouse, who in order, the, the calculation that I'm working on is based on the amount of the value of dollars or fiat currency in dollars held in, in the correspondent banking system, which is what Ripple and XRP want to replace. Essentially, correspondent banking is used um, today. It's very slow for sending cross-border payments. It's very, it takes up to three days. Um, and in order to 
for this the way this payment system works is I have to pre-fund as a bank or a financial institution I have to pre-fund bank my bank account with other financial institutions in different countries and this essentially locks up a load of money in these accounts which are only can, there to facilitate the settlement of cross-border payments so how much is is there let's see what uh, Brad says about this global pre-funded what are called Nostra Vostra relationships it represents something on the order of magnitude 10 trillion dollars okay that's 10 trillion dollars from Brad I don't necessarily trust Brad so I went off and tried to find sources for that statement and interestingly enough like on, on Ripple's own website they state it's 5 trillion as we the spreadsheet I've captured the, the data here Brad says 10 trillion Another way of calculating it as I was looking into this is some people suggest that the easy way of calculating this is looking at the SWIFT daily settlement value. So SWIFT, for those people that don't know, is really the, the, the largest kind of cross-border payments infrastructure service provider. It provides a messaging layer for international settlement between banks. And by looking at old... Um, by the way that that was four years ago that clip from brad so this is all of this is quite old data because i found it really difficult to find anyone citing how much money is stored in nostro vostro accounts and from the last couple of years a little bit odd i don't know conspiracy theories theorists please uh, let me know what your thoughts are on that but the oldest you know i found a few um web pages that claimed that swift was settling between five and six trillion dollars worth of payments a day. So by implication is if SWIFT is managing to move that much money around, that much money needs to be in the correspondent banking system. So how does that impact uh, or give us a model for predicting or forecasting the XRP price? Well, the whole point of on-demand liquidity is that you're, you're taking this money that's locked up in uh, correspondent banking accounts, Nostro Vostro accounts, you're buying XRP and you're actually not storing it in a bank account, but it's actually an exchange will buy XRP and hold that, X, that XRP in, in, in a country. And then on demand liquidity, if I want to send you £10, my bank will take the £10 from my account. It will use on demand liquidity to buy XRP. Um, either in the home exchange or even in the beneficiary exchange in the US. I need to figure out, figure that one out. But it buys XRP, let's say it buys it from a local market in Sterling. It whizzes that XRP across to an exchange in the US and it ex instructs that exchange to sell it for US dollars and then, it, and then the US dollars will be remitted to your beneficiary in the US. So that's how it works. And what it means is that the correspondent banking accounts get slowly drained of the five trillion that's locked in them. Who will drain them? Well, the ex exchanges like Coinbase, for example, will buy XRP or Ripple will gift it to them from its escrow um, or sell it to them cheaply from its escrow. Either way, dollars get or dollars or fiat currency from the uh, Nostro Vostro correspondent banking system gets turned into XRP that's now sitting on exchanges. So that means there's it, there's an increase in the market capitalization of this XRP. So if if we say that Ripple is um, successful enough to turn 10% of the 5 trillion held in correspondent banking in, into XRP for use for cross-border payments by systems like ODL, well, that would mean that there would be $500 billion minimum locked up in uh, XRP in these exchanges to, to facilitate cross-border payments. And that would mean a stable price of $5 for XRP. Now, there's lots of ifs and buts. This is, this is very crude. It's not a scientific analysis. But I just want to convey to you what the central prop proposition that Ripple has for XRP. Other companies have different use cases for XRP, and that's going to increase the price even more, I think, because there's more utility. But from Ripple's perspective, imagine they can get 10% of, they can liberate 10% of the funds held in Nostro Vostro banking. That's a market cap of 500 um, billion, which is a $5 representation if you look at the total 
fully diluted supply. And this again, this this valuation um, isn't on the circulating supply of XRP. So it's on the fully dilute, diluted valuation, which is the 100 million, um, sorry, 100 billion XRP that would be floated around minus um, any XRP that's burned. It looks like 10 million XRP has been burned so far. And there's a slow deflationary pressure on the XRP supply from burning. So actually, you know, this is a long term price prediction. It could fluctuate much higher than that. Um, it could be double that based on the circulating supply and then come slowly come back down. Um, yeah, and correspondent banking, interestingly, from the Bank of International Settlements is on the wane at the moment, but the value locked in there is increasing. Now, I tried to find the value for this and it just gives you percentages. It just doesn't give you a clear cut like there's 10 trillion locked up. But cross-border payments volume and value increased by 2 to 7% respectively in 2020. Correspondent banking relationships declined by 4% from the previous year, um, taking their total contraction to about 25% between 2011 and 2020. So these banking relationships, which are costly and ineffective, are on the decline. They are being replaced. And I think, you know, part of that replacement pressure has to be coming from Ripple, not not all of it by any extent. This is quite a large amount, 25% reduction in correspondent banking. The value of the payments and the volume has gone up, but the number of participants has gone down. To me, that really is indicative of um, smaller institutions potentially using fintechs uh, or banks that have been enabled, like a single bank that's been enabled with ODL. It's just far easier for them to deal with rather than having these uh, opening multiple accounts in multiple countries, that kind of thing. So I, I hope that was useful and um, some, some food for thought. And uh, if you like this video, like, um, like it, make sure you tap that like button, subscribe and share with your friends. Thank you very much. Cheers.